Hi, welcome to the annual Children's Clean Water Festival with Tillamook Estuaries Partnership. This is day two, and we're going to do a little bit of art and some vocabulary and some writing today as we go through. Most of the things going to be a presentation on a uh, on the fish and the contest that goes along with it. So it's going to be a PowerPoint presentation. And as we go through, there'll be some things that you'll need to have with you. Be a good idea to have that packet that we got you all set up with because you're going to want to turn to the fishy art contest. And the first sheet you're going to have is going to be the fish adaptations or fishy adaptations. And we'll go through that together and fill it in so that you don't get all panicked. But it's going to be important information you're going to need to know. So make sure you have that with you. And we'll go ahead and get started. So this is Fishy Adaptations, presented by me, Bruce Carden, and my partner in crime, Alex Lee Tigner. And you'll see her. Alex, you want to say hi? There you go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So she's going to be in the same room with me, but we've got lots of social distancing between us. That's why we're not wearing any masks. There's quite a bit of distance in between, but you want to make sure you're wearing your masks if you're in school and make sure you're social distancing to make sure everybody's safe. This is brought to you by the Tillamook Estuaries Partnership, and we'll get going without any more ado. So first off, you're going to need this packet. You want to turn to this page that's in that packet and it's Fishy Adaptations Worksheet, and we're gonna go through that together and I'll help you fill it out. You're gonna need a pen or a pencil to write with, probably a pencil with a good eraser, but maybe not. And then markers, and I know you got some of those from yesterday, or if you wanted to do crayons or color pencils, that would be something you'd have to supply yourself, but you don't have to have those right away, because that part's gonna actually take place after the presentation itself. First off, if you're looking at that sheet, I'm going to go through and I'm going to give you the answers. Wow, what a deal is that, huh? And then I'm going to have you, when we start doing some of the vocabulary, I'm going to say the word and have you say it with me. And then we'll give you the keywords to write in those boxes. And that will help you in your understanding of what fish need for adaptations to living underwater and to survive. So the first question on your sheet is, how many fish are there? Well, there's your answer. It's in orange. There's over 25,000 different fish species in the world. That's a lot of fish, and they're all over the world. And so that's a great question to ask is, hey, what kind of fish is this? Well, if you'll look, it says a Chinook salmon, which is one of our native fish in the area, which is very awesome to be able to have that as a representation. And we will talk about what kind of fish it is in a little bit, but I'll give you a hint to start with. It's called an, an, an anadromous fish. And we'll talk about the definition that goes along with that too. So the first answer is 25,000 different fish species in the world. Now this one is not a place for you to write down, but isn't that a cool looking fish? It's called a paddlefish, but you might wonder how many different fish there are in North America. Well, there's over, 2,000 or about 2,000 in North America. And that paddlefish is actually found in the Southwest United States and kind of in the Midwest. And its range is anywhere from Louisiana, clear up to the uh, Minnesota and Wyoming, clear over to Pennsylvania because that is the Mississippi River watershed. Because it's not just the Mississippi River, but you have the Ohio River and you have the Missouri River and the Platte River, just to name a few of the real big ones that go into it. But it not that a whole lot. That's amazing. So that paddlefish is kind of cool looking, but there's 2,000 in North America. No place to write that one down, but just an interesting fact. So this one is here to let you know that they're vertebrae. Fish represent half of all vertebrae animals. And a vertebrae is a fish with a backbone or an animal with a backbone. If you've ever caught a fish and had to clean it, when you've gone through and done that process, you probably have come across the vertebrae on that, but you think half of all the vertebrae in the world are fish. That's pretty impressive. And this is a channel catfish. 
and it's found in the Southwest and the Midwest in the United States. Not so much around here. We do have catfish, just not channel catfish. Well, you might be wondering how fish survive life underwater. Well, first off, you need to know that fish can be found pretty much wherever there's water on the earth. Probably not in the puddle in the parking lot, but other places around like the oceans and the rivers and the lakes, they're around quite a bit. And you need to know this, that three-fourths of the Earth's surface is covered by water. That is a whole lot of water that's out there. A lot of it's the salt water, the oceans and tide pools. And around here, you're probably pretty familiar with tide pools and the coral reefs. And then you have fresh water, the lakes, the cold mountain streams, and the slow-moving rivers. And we have lots of lakes and rivers around here. And we got those streams. They're kind of cold for sure. But there's not very much fresh water in the whole world. Most of it's the salt water. And then you have the brackish water. And we have these around here because it's bays and estuaries where the salt water and the fresh water meet. And that's actually pretty full of life. That's pretty amazing. And we live in a special place here in Tillamook County on the Northwest Coast because we have all of those available to us. So you might be wondering how the fish survive underwater. Well, we're gonna start talking about the adaptations and that word adapted is one of those words I want you to say, adapted. Okay, cool. Now we're gonna look and we're gonna make it a little longer and say an adaptation is a particular characteristic of a plant or an animal that makes it better suited to its environment. In other words, it's there to help the fish survive or the animals survive. And you can see those fish that are in here. And we're gonna start talking about the individual adaptations. So here's one that you're gonna to need to write in. Actually, on the question number two, fish are adapted to life underwater. There's five things you're gonna write in there. And I'll let you know when you're supposed to write. One is gills, and we're gonna talk about that. So put gills in there for question number two, and we'll add more to it later on. But a gill is pretty important to a fish. Think of it as like the lungs for us with we breathe in and out. Well, the gills on a fish are kind of feathery and the water passes through the gills and the gills absorb the oxygen and then the carbon dioxide is removed. So that's how they breathe. So it's pretty important for them to have clean water. When you have muddy water or dirty water, it makes it tough. It's kind of like you being in a smoky room or next to a campfire and the smoke's all coming your way and it kind of burns your eyes and makes it tough to breathe. Gills are important for fish to make sure that they are able to breathe. And they're covered with these gill plates. And that picture you're seeing there is the gill with the plate removed. But that gill plate's pretty important to protect it, to keep them safe. So another one that we're gonna put on your list of how are fish adapted are fins. And we're gonna go through six different fins here. And you're gonna start filling in on the paper, the kind of fins when we get to it. But those fins are important for mobilization and our stabilization and movement as we go. So, so far you have fish adapted to life underwater, gills and fins. And now we're gonna look at what each fin does. Okay, the first fin we're going to talk about is on the very top of the fish. It's called a dorsal fin, and it keeps the fish from rolling. So I want you to look at the picture on, you've got, and on top of the fish, I want you to write in dorsal fin. Why don't you say it with me? Dorsal fin. Cool. And now we want to remember that it keeps the fish from rolling. So dorsal fin keeps from rolling is what you really need to write in there. So, make, so it doesn't spin out of control when it's fishing. Okay, we're going to go to the next one. This one's cool because it says an adipose fin. Say that one with me, adipose fin. Nice. Okay, so the adipose fin helps with balance in turbulent water. And actually, that's the fin when they talk about this fish has had its fin clipped. That's the fin that they'll clip in a hatchery before they release it. So you can tell the difference between a wild fish and a hatchery fish by the adipose fin. If it's been clipped, it's a hatchery fish. If it's a wild fish, it hasn't been clipped and you know it's there. So the adipose fin, and it helps with balance. So on the box, you wanna write in adipose fin and the word balance. 
We'll go through this at the very end and you'll have kind of an answer sheet you can copy off of if you don't get it all. The next fin we're gonna talk about is the caudal fin. Say it with me, caudal fin. Nice. Okay, so the caudal fin, it's gonna help the fish to propel and steer. So in your box on the tail end of the fish, you wanna write caudal fin and write propel and steer. Pretty important for that fish to have the caudal fin in place so that it can go through the water. So think like propellers on a boat and to help it steer. So think like a rudder on a boat that allows it to turn. That caudal fin is very important for the fish. Well, they all are important, but that one in particular. Notice they're all cutthroat trout that we're going through. This next one, this one's called the anal fin. Go ahead and say it with me, anal fin. Cool. All right, now that helps with the balance. It's found on the back side of the fish on the bottom, and it's pretty important. So if you want to write in anal fin and then write in the word balance, you'll be in great shape. The next fin we're gonna look at is the pelvic fin. And the pelvic fin is helping it to stabilize and helps with balance. Notice a lot of these fins help with balance on these fish, but the pelvic fin is found right in the middle of the fish. Just like you have a pelvis in the middle of your body, the pelvic fin on the fish is right in the middle of the fish and it helps stabilize it so it doesn't spin out of control and it helps it with the balance. So write that one in under, you'll find the pelvic fin that's there. And then the next one is the pectoral fin. And that helps with the diving and the swimming to the surface and the remaining stationary. Pretty important for this fish, pectoral fin, say it with me, pectoral fin. Cool. Now you're gonna wanna write in the word diving and surface and stationary. So diving, yeah, I think you get diving in, you know you're going under the water, but they need to come up to the surface sometimes too. So the fin will move and adjust so that the fish can go through one way or the other, either go down or go up. And sometimes it just wants to stay stationary. If you see a fish is just kind of staying in one spot, that's stationary and you watch and those little fins are just kind of moving back and forth, helping them in that stationary process. Hope you're doing a good job getting this stuff down. I bet you are. And then what are some of the adaptations that help to survive? Remember that question number two, this is another word you're gonna to have to write in after gills and fins, you have to write in swim bladder. So write in swim bladder and think of it as a balloon. If you don't sure how to spell it, it's on the screen, but think of it as a balloon. That's an airtight sac that's inside the gut area and it regulates flotation and buoyancy. In other words, when it gets full of air, the fish comes up, you see the red arrow, it's going up. And when it wants to go down, it lets that air out and it lets it sink down. And if it wants to stay about in the middle of the water, not go up or down, it's about medium fill. That's pretty important for allowing that fish to move where it needs to go up or down. But the swim bladder, every fish has one that allows them to move up or down. And that is the dotted line one that's on that fish. And there's a spot that goes up to it or it goes, it comes from the top and goes down the swim bladder. And I put regulates buoyancy. And if you're going, can't remember that, you can put a little arrow next to it for up, a little arrow for down, and a little arrow off to the right that says for, it'll help you to remember, it goes up or down. Okay, now another thing you're gonna put in there is scales. This is on question number two. So we have gills, we have fins, we have swim bladder, and we have scales. Now scales, there's four different kinds of scales. And they have the placoid, which is on the shark. It's kind of an interesting looking thing. It's sharp pointed, it looks like, but just think shark and thinking shark's teeth pointed. It'll help you on that one. And they have the ganoid scale, that's on a gar. A gar is kind of a long skinny fish and it's more in the Southwest part of the United States. We don't really have them around here. They're not native. If they're here, they're an invasive species. And then you have the, tenoid, which is on a perch. And then the last one that we're really going to look at is the cycloid. And that's on the salmon. So I think salmon, uh, trout, those types of things. And there's some interesting information. If you look up, it talks about you can actually tell the age of a fish by its scales, particularly on a cycloid. So you don't have to write those 
kinds of cells down, but what are scales down, but we do want the word scales written in there. Now, another word we're going to have is camouflage. So say the word camouflage with me. You're probably pretty familiar with the word camouflage because you tend to hear it a lot. But remember, it is the protective coloring that helps them to blend in. So if I were a bird, like an eagle, looking down in the water, I'd see the back of this trout, and it would be kind of spotted and kind of greenish, and it'll look like the sea or the bottom of the river. And I think, huh, I'm not going to mess with that. Or if I were underneath and I was a bigger fish and I was looking up, it's kind of white, it looks like the sky up above, and it kind of helps it to blend in too. So camouflage is kind of an important word. And I think that's on your sheet down on the bottom right that says, Color the fish to help it blend in with its environment. And this is called camouflage. So that's where you want to write in the word camouflage. And I couldn't write it on the blue, so I wrote it on the white right underneath it. But camouflage is an important part of the adaptation for the fish to help it survive. So you want to have on question number two, you want to have gills, fins, swim bladder, scales, and camouflage. And you got all five that you need. I bet you're doing great getting that down. Okay, I told you we're going to see it again. So let's go and take a look at the next screen. All right, this is one of my favorite words, anadromous. Say that with me, anadromous. And we're going to put a definition with that. And it means going from freshwater to saltwater. So salmon do that. We have a lot of salmon that will do it. They'll hatch in freshwater. And as they grow, they'll come into the bay. Tillamook Bay is a great spot for that, but you have other bays that in the watershed that we've talked about from yesterday. And they will hang in there till they're old enough and they get acclimated in the salt water. And then they'll swim out in the salt water and they'll go for three to five years and they'll swim as far away as Japan or as far north as Alaska. And then something inside of them tells them it's time to come back home to spawn and they'll come back only to the estuary that they left. So if they are from Tillamook Bay, they'll only come back to Tillamook Bay. When you think about the whole West Coast of the United States, that's pretty impressive. And then once they get to the bay, they'll only go to the river that they came out of. So if they came out of the Trask River, they'll only go to the Trask River to go ahead and spawn. That's pretty cool. So say that word with me again, anadromous. Sweet, nice job, folks. Okay, so that is also on your sheet. And um, it is talking about where, that's question number three. And it says some fish can survive in both freshwater and saltwater and spend different parts of their lives in each. These types of fish are anadromous. Nice. Okay, let's check this out. This is the answer sheet, so see how you did. The words you really need to get are the bold print words like the caudal fin and then the orange words like propel and steer and the adipose fin and balance. And the dorsal fin, fish from roll, keeps them from rolling. And the swim bladder, flotation. And the anal fin, balance. And the pelvic fin, it's stabilizer and balance. And the pectoral fins, that's diving, swimming, and remaining stationary. And the gill cover opening is helped to protect the water flow in and out. And it's their lung system. And you got the word camouflage written on there. And we've got all the labels in place. So if you forgot how to spell it, it's right there for you. Cool. You guys are doing great. Okay. Now, this is how do fish survive life underwater? Fish have special adaptations. Hopefully, you've learned that adaptations are all these things that go along to help that fish survive. And we've gone through and filled it out. This is all set. So you can see it one more time to make sure you got her down. Cool. All right, now we're going to look at the art contest. This art contest is pretty cool because we're doing two things this year. First off, Tillamook Estuaries Partnership is doing the Children's Clean Water Festival Art Contest. And we have Wildlife Forever, and it's a state fish contest. And so you can do one entry, but it's going to go to two different places for you to have possibilities to win. Look at that artwork that's there. These are kids that have spent some time drawing and doing. And when you select the media or the type of thing that you're going to do, you can do watercolors, color pencils, pastels. If you do that, you got to seal it. And I'll tell you more about that and the thing that goes on. But such opportunity. 
Okay, so the art contest, it's open to kids and it's free to you for kids from kindergarten through 12th grade. And there's a art and a creative writing piece. Now here's the catch, it's creative writing. It's not, all right, I have to write this. This is the information, here's the facts and informative piece, it's creative. So you can do poetry. You could tell the story from the fish's point of view and why it's important for them to have these adaptations or where it lives. So that would be the habitat, right? So all these things. And so it's gonna be a fun thing for you to do on the writing piece, take advantage of that. And so you have clean water contest for the children's clean water from TEP and then the wildlife forever. Now, how do you enter? Well, first off, you have a packet that we supplied you and it has all this information that I'm gonna go through again because it has the rules and guidelines for it and how you do things. And then it also has the entry form and everything. So you have it there, but you can also go to a website I'm gonna give you later on that will tell you all the same stuff. But first and probably most important is it has to be original. It means you have to do it on your own. It can't be a copy from somebody else's. It has to be your own work. And it has to be on a sheet of paper that's like eight and a half by 11 which is about the size of copy paper. There you go. And it has to be horizontal. You don't want it vertical like this. You want it horizontal like this. So make sure it's horizontal. And then you're gonna select a fish from the official fish list. And that's also in this packet that we gave you. But if you forget or lose it, you can go on to wildlifeforever.org and that'll give you the same list. Now, the second part of this is not just the art part, but also the written part. And here's some things you might want to consider. First off, it's written essay, and it's only on one side of a page. So it's not that much. You have to be pretty good at getting the information down in a concise order to make it make sense. But it's also not that much. So you can do this. And then the second, if you get stuck and you're going, I don't know where to start, go, why do you think it's important to protect our lakes, rivers, estuaries, and coastlines? That might be a great way for you to start to write your piece and go from that perspective. But if you wanted to tell a story from the fish's point of view about how maybe I was born in the water and I know that there's things that I have to, I don't know, however you want to make it up, but have some fun with it. Here's some examples. And if you go to that website, wildlifeforever.org, it'll have some past winners, their pictures and entries to kind of give you some ideas. And there's also a spot on there where the judges tell you some things you want to include in your writing piece. So it kind of give you an idea that goes with that. Okay, so how to enter. You're going to submit your entry to actually us. What's going to happen is you have until March 17th. So two weeks from now, you have to work on this. You have weekends or in the evenings or whatever. Maybe your teacher will give you some time in class. But the art contest and the writing piece, and what'll happen is give to your teacher with everything filled out by the 17th. And then Alex or I will come around and we'll pick them up from your teachers. And if you have everything filled out on the entry forms, we will just take care of that. And we will do our, our judging from our point of view from the Tillamook Estuaries Partnership for our contest. And then we will send them into for you to wildlife forever. So it won't cost you a thing if you get them to us and then we'll go ahead and take care of that other part. And the winners will be announced from the Clean Water Festival by the beginning of April and the wildlife forever will announce theirs at the beginning of May. So here's some things. First place, if I win the Children's Clean Water Festival contest, I'll get two tickets for the Oregon Coast Scenic Railroad and Salmon Stream, which is a book. Second place will be an art supply basket in Salmon Stream. And the third one will be the book Salmon Stream. They're all by Carol Reed Jones. And if you want to know the prizes for Wildlife Forever contest, go to wildlifeforever.org. And there's the fish art contest. And they'll give you all the information you need there. So here's the part where I go, you got any questions for me? You can type in your questions in the chat. And recording will be available soon. Yesterday, we got it all set, we got it recorded, but we didn't get it uploaded onto the TEP website, but it will be today for yesterday's on the watershed and hopefully we'll get today's up today for this as well. Don't forget to check out the online exhibit hall at the uh, TEP website as well. That pretty much concludes this part. Now we'll take questions. 
Okay. There we are. What do you got for me, Alex? Hey, Bruce. Can you share your screen again and go back? I surely can. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, where'd I go here? I thought I could share. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go to this, this one. Okay. Perfect. That's a good question. I'm glad you asked this. We can get it up for you. Yeah. So some of the questions we have are, ooh, awesome. um, why do we learn about this? Well, that's part of our world that we live in, and we want to make sure that all animals are taken care of and are safe. And so we need to make sure that um, the whole purpose of the Tillamook Estuaries Partnership is to try to ensure that we have clean water, not just for us, but for the animals who live there. And so we want to make sure that these fish have a safe, clean place to live, just like we want to live in a clean, safe place. And the fish can't go through and pick out garbage and throw it out to the dump. So we have to kind of step up and do that. We try to make sure things aren't put into the water in the first place that makes it bad for them. Does that answer the question? Or did I, I miss it? No, I think you got it. Great. Um, another question is, what are the most common fish in Oregon? Oh, wow. You know, I'm going to have to go ahead and go to my partner because she's a whole lot sharper in that than me. But I would imagine trout and salmon and catfish. Those are the ones and perch probably. What, any more? There, um, you know, I would guess there's some other things we have in our lakes and streams that are probably pretty common um that are um what's the word i'm looking for i just lost the word that i'm looking well, for. well you'll have bass that are out there because mm -hmm. when i grew up in southern oregon we'd go fishing for bass and crappie and catfish and trout those are the ones but it's more time what area are you living in and then you kind of learn the fish that are there so when you go out fishing or want to take care of them you'll kind of know what they are mm -hmm. Um, and then we did have some more questions about how do they enter the art contest and how many winners there are. Um, so the art contest, there's information in the packets. And if you don't have the packets, that information will be shared on our website um, later today or tomorrow. Um, or you can go to wildlifeforever.org to learn about the state fish art contest. Um, I do want to say this part I forgot about in the packet. There is a state fish art contest guided research form. Mm -hmm. So when you select your fish off of the official list of fish, okay, you're going to have to go off the official list of fish. And there's some specialty fish, so you want to select those. But use this as a guide for your research. And you don't have to write complete sentences, just get down the information. And then when you go to write your paper, that's when you want to put in your complete sentences. And it has some great, like, what's the species name and the size and the appearance, life expectancy, what does it eat, what eats it, um, is it freshwater, saltwater, or both, like a salmon, the anadromous, and then what kind of behavior does it have? So those kind of things you're going to want to do as well. And as far as the winners, we'll have three winners for the, t for the Clean Water Festival Art Contest, but this will just be from, um, for fourth and fifth grade students for the Clean Water Festival Art Contest, those that attended the Clean Water Festival. For the State Fish Art Contest, there um, it's a national contest, um, so you can enter from any state in the United States, and there are a number of different winners. And you can go to their website at wildlifeforever.org, and we'll share this information with your teachers um, to learn more about that specifically. Um, some of the other questions that we had were, Bruce, have you ever caught a fish? Oh, yes. Yes, I have. One of my favorite things to do is to go fishing for salmon. I usually do it with a couple of buddies because I enjoy the time together with them as well. But I've caught salmon and trout and catfish and crappie and even some bass. So, yeah. Um, we had a couple ask about the age of fish and how long fish live for. Okay. So a salmon, their age span 
an average. Okay, remember average, there's always some exception that goes longer and some exception that goes shorter because average is, you take all that information into account. A salmon will go from about three to five years of age, depending upon some will live for six, some less. Um, but, you know, especially once you get eaten as, as prey when they're fry and stuff. But uh, one of the things that I found interesting when I was going, so I'm still learning, is on the scales, like on the cycloid, which is like the salmon, they can count the scale. They, they, they look at it like a tree ring and you count the rings on a tree to find out how old the tree is. They can do the same thing with certain fish. They look at the scales and they can look at the rings and it's very interesting. So you might want to look that one up. Um, some fish, I think I heard a sturgeon the other day, I saw, I was reading, it's like over a hundred years old. And, you know, some fish, they don't have a very long lifespan at all. We talk about goldfish, you know, so um, they're out there, they're different ages, but that's a good thing for you to look up. Instead of just waiting for us to answer, do some research and find out on your own, especially if you have a good fish that you're wanting to know more about. That's a great answer. And I did, I had a job where I actually aged rockfish and Sweet. I aged a rockfish that was 103 years old. And that's not a, that old of a rockfish. They can live a lot longer. And Christy Foster on here tells us that Greenland sharks can live for 400 years. Sweet. So we've got quite the age range. So we'll I do... guess you could say that's the rock of ages on that yeah. rockfish, huh? <laughs> So we'll do one more question here before we um, stop the presentation. It's a little after 1030. Um, so what is the biggest fish in Oregon? Boy, the biggest fish, I would imagine sturgeon. They get to be a pretty good size. Um, the older they are, the bigger they are. And then after that, I'm not sure, probably salmon. I've seen some good sized salmon. It's been a while since I've seen some caught that are like 50, 60 pounds, but salmon are usually a pretty good sized fish as well. That's a great question. You know, one thing that helps determine the size of a fish and why salmon can get so big is that they are able to, they're anadromous. And so they get to go out to the ocean, which gives them a different food source yeah. from fish that stay in our freshwater streams. Those fish only have access to a certain kind of food. So the ability for a salmon to go out into the ocean for a number of years allows them to get much, much larger and reach those really big sizes. Whereas mm. a trout that stays in a freshwater stream, it stays pretty small and doesn't get that, that advantage to become bigger. So Alex, a question I've got for you that I've heard in the past just want a confirmation is, the reason that salmon have pink flesh is because of the food that they eat. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So if you've eaten salmon or caught a salmon, you'll see that their flesh is a very pink color. And that's because one of their primary things that they eat is krill or things like small um, shrimp. And those are pink themselves. And that pigment or that coloration is then brought into the color of their flesh. And so they end up turning pink. Very cool. So that's, we'll call it good for today. Nice. And we thank everyone for attending. We'll be back next Tuesday with a guest, our guests from Twin Rocks Friends Camp, teaching you all about uh, macroinvertebrates and uh, wetland wonders. So join us again there. This recording and yesterday's recording will be posted to our website um, today. And we hope that you'll keep joining along with us during Clean Water Festival. Hey, one last thing, Alex. I'm hoping that you folks are seeing the, the interconnection with the uh, watershed yesterday and how big they are. And then today, the fish, the animals that live there, and there's more than that. And it has to be clean water for them to live in. They, they need to have that. And then we're going to look at the macros. And that's also indicative of clean water. So that's important for the food, for the fish. It's all interrelated, folks. We're in this together. That's right. All right. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and we will see you next week. Bye. Okay. You're going to have to end it. I didn't have